This week on ANN, the Adventist Church in Cuba keeps strong amid social unrest. Adventist leaders in Ghana visit top government leaders in the country to talk about religious freedom. And the Adventist Church in Haiti asks for prayer amid ongoing violence in the country. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, Seventh-day Adventist leaders in Cuba have not been able to connect with church members as anti-government protests have escalated across the island nation. The protests, which began on July 11, are a result of power outages, continued lockdowns due to the coronavirus pandemic, and the scarcity of food and medicine. There is currently no internet across the island, and internet is the main form of communication between church leaders and members used for worship, prayer, Bible studies, and circulation of important information. President of the Adventist Church in Cuba, Aldo Perez, said, This is a situation without presidents here. We need the strength from God for we are living by faith. I know that our country is very disturbed amid the challenges the nation is facing, but God continues to strengthen his church during difficult times. The scarcity of food, rising food prices, and the lack of medicine has caused leaders to mobilize members to pray and fast more fervently, especially during the past two weeks. Regardless of the hardships experienced, Perez said that God is working miracles among his people. For the past two Sabbaths, prayer vigils have taken place across Cuba. On Sabbath, July 10, the entire church on the island took part in fasting and prayer, and many from Spain and the United States joined to pray for peace, protection, and increased faith. The only way Perez has been able to communicate with the leaders in the four regional conferences on the island has been through land or cellular lines. The church in Cuba has more than 100 district pastors who lead some 345 churches and oversee nearly 2,000 small groups. For years, the church has enjoyed good relations with the government, added Perez, who said that the church is continuing to ask members to keep safe and not engage in political issues, but to fully support the people of Cuba through prayer. Perez said, God is sustaining us with his hand and we solicit the prayers from all our brothers and sisters in the inter-America and around the world so we don't feel alone and see God's work in bringing peace and reconciliation to our nation right. For more information, visit interamerica.org. The president of Ghana, Nana Akufu Adu, has pledged his personal support to address some religious liberty issues affecting Adventists in Ghana. He gave this assurance on June 20 when church leaders visited him at his home to discuss some national development and religious liberty matters affecting the Adventist church in the country. Adventist students in Ghana grapple with writing examinations on Saturdays, and members may be unable to vote in Ghana's next elections because they will be held on Sabbath, December 7, 2024. Close to a million Seventh-day Adventist voters will be unable to vote if nothing is done about it. In 1996, the voting day fell on Saturday and over 95% of Adventist voters refused to vote. On examinations on the Sabbath, President Akufu Adu said Ghana is a secular state, but he also assured church leaders that he will explore avenues for change in the voting date. Akufu Adu said, disenfranchising a lot of people because of the date is not the best thing to do. Though the date is entrenched constitutional clause, we will look into the possibilities of advocating for change from the specific date to a day in December, as is done in some countries. Leave it to me, and I will begin the process of public discourse. I am glad this has come up early, and so there is time to do so and get consensus around the political divide. Adventist leaders also congratulated the president on his re-election, his efficient management of the COVID-19 situation, and on Ghana's election as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. The leaders thanked him for the support Adventist schools, hospitals, and religious liberty provisions members have enjoyed under his tenure. Church leaders assured the president of the church's support and continual prayers for his government and the nation. Also in Ghana, the country's Minister of Education, Honorable Yah Adetuam, has assured Adventist church leaders that his ministry will ensure that national examinations at the secondary level are not held on Saturdays. 
He gave this assurance when leaders of the Adventist Church and Seventh-day Adventist instructors recently called to congratulate him on his appointment as the substantive head of the Ministry of Education. The presidents of the two administrative unions in Ghana, Kwame Bokam Wanin and Thomas Teki Okran, congratulated Atatwam and assured him of the church's support to help improve education in Ghana. Akran said, we will always pray for you. And we pledge that the Seventh-day Adventist Church will cooperate with the ministry to achieve Ghana's education goals. Akran also used the opportunity to reiterate the church's plea for the curtailment of Sabbath exams for entry level examinations, especially at the secondary level. He asked the government to absorb some Adventist secondary schools that were facing challenges in the face of the free senior high school policy. In response, the minister said he is willing to work with faith-based organizations to facilitate children's access to education, but schools must show proof of performance to qualify for absorption. The minister also briefed the delegation on the government's new educational policy, which emphasizes STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Some of the Adventist leaders in Haiti continue to appeal to church members to pray for God's protection and peace in the streets in the wake of the assassination of Haiti's president this week. President of the Adventist Church in Haiti, Pierre Coffral, said that everything is moving slowly because those living in the country don't know what is coming next and many are scared. Kapoor, who has been working remotely from his home in Carrefour, says many of the leaders and church employees who do not live close to the church's union office and conferences in downtown Port-au-Prince remain working remotely as well. At this point, church leaders are not sure if churches in Port-au-Prince will be able to open for worship services this coming Sabbath. Church members in Haiti don't know if they'll be able to hold services, but say they intend to broadcast spiritual messages through the radio station Radio Esperance, which covers most of Haiti. They also have programming through Hope Media Haiti, which is carried to most of the large cities in the country. Kaporal appeals to the rest of the world church to pray on behalf of Haiti. He says, we ask for God to stabilize the situation strengthen the faith of members, and motivate them to keep involved in the mission of sharing hope in every circumstance. Coming up, a father and son duo have found a unique way of raising money for address humanitarian efforts. But up next, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency in Kyrgyzstan works to provide accurate information on COVID-19 prevention. Why is there evil in the world? Are Christians hypocrites? Is the Bible a fairy tale? Does Jesus love everyone? Church doesn't feel relevant to my life. Is God even real? You have questions? Let's talk about it. I Believe Bible. Welcome back. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency, or ADRA, is launching 39 neighborhood information centers in Kyrgyzstan to create awareness about COVID-19 prevention and vaccination. They also aim to help vulnerable people access needed social services during the pandemic. ADRA's Kyrgyzstan's local leaders say the lack of understanding of the importance of safety measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 is a problem in the country. While some people want to receive the vaccine but don't know where to get it, others believe false rumors about the vaccine and refuse to have it. People in the region are also suffering from other impacts of COVID-19, including lost income, reduced access to health care, domestic violence, and higher cost of goods. To address these problems, ADRA developed a plan to make information more accessible to the community. The project will follow a model that has been used successfully by ADRA in Kyrgyzstan for nearly two decades. In each targeted neighborhood or community, ADRA will send 10 to 12 respected, civic-minded individuals to form a self-help group. ADRA will train the group members and provide them with information to share with the community about COVID-19 and public services. 
Each group will open a public consultation and information center in the home of a group member or in a local government building where the public can receive trusted information. Working with the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the region, as well as the government agencies, ADRA is recruiting 390 volunteers to run 39 information centers in six cities and villages in Kyrgyzstan. Coronavirus cases are on the rise in Kyrgyzstan, promoting fears of another deadly wave of illness like the one that the country experienced in July of last year. Kyrgyzstan has administered enough COVID-19 vaccine doses to fully vaccinate less than 2% of the population, according to local reports. On July 16, Hurley and Andreas Meyer, a father and son sea kayaking team located in the U.S. state of Maryland, will embark on a self-styled expedition they've named the Bay 200 Challenge. The Bay 200 Challenge is a 12-day kayaking journey to raise money for hunger, one of the most pressing COVID-19 related issues affecting people today. The father and son duo will journey on a 200 mile north to south traverse of the Chesapeake Bay in the US East Coast, the largest bay in the United States. The Bay 200 Challenge is supporting Address COVID-19 hunger pandemic response campaign, which aims to raise 3 million by July 31st. Adra International sent this report. Hi, this is my kayak. It's about 16 feet long. It's a sea kayak, and this is where I keep all my snacks. Uh, well, my dad came up with the idea. It was kind of scary because the thought of paddling 200 miles is a lot, and the most I paddled is like 50 miles. And I said yes because I just wanted to have like a long time with my dad and spend time with him. I also thought it was a good idea because I wanted to give back to the community and help others in need. Andreas Meyer, a 13-year-old Maryland teen, and his father are launching the Bay 200 Challenge to raise awareness and support for COVID-19 hunger relief. And we're going to be paddling 200 miles. Uh, it's just going to be an exciting opportunity to just connect uh, with each other, but also to do something different. There are a lot of families out there that are depending on us, that are struggling with the issue of hunger, especially after months uh, without having incomes or jobs as a result of COVID. And so there's so many things that we can do, and it doesn't take a whole lot, So, but I encourage you to get out there and try it. The Bay 200 Challenge is supporting ADRA, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency's COVID-19 Hunger Pandemic Response Campaign. The Maryland-based nonprofit aims to raise $3 million by July 31st. The funds will provide food assistance and essential supplies to families who have been hit hard by the pandemic. There are many ways that you can actually get involved. You know, we've decided that, you know, for us, a kayaking challenge is the way to go. We love kayaking. Uh, we enjoy getting outdoors. So as we were looking at how could we connect uh, the Bay 200 Challenge to a cause, uh, it just made perfect sense to uh, support uh, ADRA. You know, they're a wonderful organization that we know, and uh, you know, they've been doing a lot of work uh, over the last year or so, especially to help families uh, who have been affected uh, by COVID. And so we wanted to join forces to support that cause uh, because it is very relevant. And uh, you know, a lot of times we forget because things here in the U.S. Uh, are, are changing, uh, and uh, but we forget that you know in other countries the situation is is very difficult whatever you can do to support Adger's COVID response whatever you could do to support Hurley and his son as they do this Bay Challenge will be much appreciated any little bit helps to support what we're doing as Adger is present in over 120 countries and more than half of our countries are at a very high level of COVID risk so we are supporting communities with food security, getting their livelihoods back together. We're supporting nations like, like India and the rest of South Asia that are really bubbling right now and are really suffering and uh, helping hospital systems that are on their knees. that are on their knees in terms of supplies, that in terms of, of, of medical support. Hurley and his son have been training since last year for the big challenge. They go in the Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac to travel about 60 miles each time to get ready. The Bay 200 Challenge will take about 12 days. The father and son team are launching the trip from Elk River Park in Elton, Maryland. 
and will kayak down the eastern part of the bay all the way down to Smith Island, Virginia, where the bay meets the Atlantic Ocean. Every day we're going to try to do about 17 uh, to 20 miles, uh, depending on the tides, depending on the weather. Uh, and we're going to be camping along the way, just wherever we, uh, we end up. Uh, we have all our gear in our kayaks. Uh, we have uh, a place to, you know, our tent. Uh, we have also a lot of our safety equipment, uh, our, our uh, maps. Guys, come outside, support us, cheer us on, and you can help by donating on the online to help stop hunger. Every dollar counts, and so don't wait. We're going to be doing all the hard work. We're going to be paddling uh, over 100 hours, but you know, come on, help us. Uh, we encourage you to do that. It's going to be very easy for you to do that, and so you're going to be blessed, and you're going to be blessing others. If you'd like more information on the Bay 200 Challenge, you can visit adra.org slash bay200challenge slash give. Advent Health partnered with the Tampa Bay Lightning hockey team for a recent vaccination event attended by Dr. Jill Biden, the First Lady of the United States. Rochelle Hones from the West Coast Florida Division reports by Advent Health. As the official health and wellness partner with the Bolts, we had the honor of hosting the First Lady of the United States at our Advent Health vaccine table. We've been holding these vaccination events during the home games of the Stanley Cup playoffs as part of our commitment to make it easy for the community to get protected. Well, last week, a big visitor, First Lady Jill Biden stopped by to take a look around. We want everyone to be protected because your lives and your health matter to me and to your president. It was an amazing experience. And honestly, um, the First Lady was exactly as I expected her to be. I mean, just a down to earth, <laughs> genuine person. She was just very, very, very impressed. And I imagine she has visited vaccine clinics all over the nation, um, but pretty awesome that she stopped into Tampa to see our efforts here. As you may know, COVID-19 cases continue to drop, but vaccination rates have also slowed. And the White House wants 70% of American adults to have at least one dose by July 4th. And we're spreading the word that everyone over 12 is eligible for a vaccine. For Advent Health, I'm Rochelle Haynes. Coming up, David Trim is here with This Week in Adventist History. But up next, Adventist Mission shares a mission story from Chattanooga in the U.S. state of Tennessee. Welcome back. Piece of Thread Chattanooga, located in the U.S. state of Tennessee, is part of the Adventist Muslim Friendship Association. The goal of the group is to get together, to sew, to make beautifully designed purses, and get to know each other as well as share one another's experiences. Adventist Mission has more. On a Sunday afternoon in a small town near the city of Chattanooga, a group gathers for a purse party. We represent Peace of Thread, which is um, a local initiative, and it's under the umbrella of AMFA, which is Adventist Muslim Friendship Association. We had a purse party, and it was in somebody's home, and so she invited a lot of her friends from the church that they attend, and then we set up and showed them the purses. Uh, of course, we have a variety. There's no two purses that are alike. We make sure of that. And so every person that buys is going to have something unique and something that is their own. Inside each one of the purses, we have a little tag that tells about the refugee that sewed that purse and a little bit about AMFA. And we ask each lady that buys to be able to pray for that refugee. With the purse party wrapping up, Mona helps Darlene put away the remaining purses. Mona, who arrived as a refugee 11 years ago, 
is both in leadership at Omfa and a designer for Piece of Thread Chattanooga. We sell a lot of things, a lot of purses, and God bless us with all kind of people that came here. So we're looking forward to the, for the next time, next, next, next meeting, another, uh, another house. Maybe next month we will be at, at my house. Malek, see you tomorrow. During the summer, Amfa has a summer school for Muslim refugee children, helping them to integrate into America in a godly way. But at the same time, we started sewing classes for the women and that's where we started with Piece of Thread, so that they're actually learning to sew, learning to sew purses, and now being able to sell them and make some money. It's Monday, and the women of Piece of Thread Chattanooga are gathering for their weekly sewing class. The sewing class takes place in various church fellowship halls, though someday they hope to have a more permanent location. Nima starts the day off with a quick testimony. The women talk about their week, Darlene talks about the successes of Sunday afternoon, makes some announcements, and after a short prayer, they begin on a new purse design. Part of the whole experience is not just about learning to sew, of course, but it's getting together and getting acquainted with each other and listening to you know, what their needs are and what their experiences are and sharing those with us as leaders with them, but also with each other because so many of these ladies didn't know each other before and so they have sisters that they can call on you know to answer questions and to just share the highs and lows of life. Rhonda, who was a nurse in Sudan before coming to the United States as a refugee, will be starting her studies to become a medical assistant later this year. It's helped me to uh, organize my time first and uh, my boys, they love that too. And I got the machine. They said, oh, mom, we don't have to throw our, our clothes. We can, you can sew to us. And that's the good things. And I organized my time to, for sewing and do what, teach uh, my, team, my kids and clean my house and do whatever I want. And first time I don't like to sew, but now I really enjoy sewing. I used to sew in my country. So when I, they add me to the Amfa group, so they, they put me as a designer. I came here as a refugee, and now my turn to help a refugee, to help them what they need, what they want, uh, especially the woman. So now they, they have an income every month. So I'm happy when I see them very happy. Well, the, the project's a big blessing to me personally, um, uh, starting off because, you know, we're given talents and uh, it's true that I can, you know, make quilts or make costumes or whatever, but it doesn't have the same joy as doing the sewing project with these ladies. You know, they're excited about n learning a new skill. It gives them something to do in their spare time and it gives them an opportunity to earn income. And for a couple of these ladies, they've never, never had their own spending money. I love seeing the ladies happy. I love seeing the ladies creating, interacting. We're a, we're a, a community and we share. And you know, this is all for God. Please pray for the relationships being formed through this initiative. Thank you for supporting Mission. You can watch this and other mission stories online by visiting AdventistMission.org, then click on videos at the top. And finally, for today's episode, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, we hear about the first Adventist minister from outside the United States who helped the church expand beyond North America into Switzerland and Germany. On July 13, 1920, one of the most significant of Adventist pioneers, but one of whom you may never have heard, passed away. Jakob Erzberger died in Switzerland. Jakob had been born near the city of Basel in German-speaking Switzerland on March 31, 1843. Having grown up in poverty, at age 21 he became a Protestant preacher. 
In 1867, Erzberger encountered a group of Adventists. A church planted by the Polish-American Michael Belina Tchaikovsky in 1867 in Tramala in French-speaking Switzerland. On a preaching tour, Jacob's trousers needed mending. The tailor he went to near Tramala was an Adventist and gave him a Bible study. Baptized in 1868, Erzberger became one of the two elders of the small company of Adventists at Tramala. They believed that they were the only ones in the entire world with their beliefs until the other elder, Albert Vuillumier, found a copy of the Review and Herald left by Tchaikovsky. To their astonishment, the Tramala Adventists learned of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America, something the eccentric Tchaikovsky had failed to mention. In 1869, Jakob Erzberger was sent to Battle Creek, Michigan to establish contact with the church. He became the first official delegate from outside North America to a general conference session and was welcomed in the home of James and Ellen White. In 1870, Jakob Erzberger was ordained as a Seventh-day Adventist minister by James White and John N. Andrews at the Massachusetts camp meeting. He was the first Adventist minister who was not an American. Erzberger was commissioned to go back to do mission work in Europe. In 1874, when J. N. Andrews went as the first Seventh-day Adventist missionary to Switzerland, Erzberger worked closely with him. And for decades, before and after Andrews, who died in 1883, Jakob conducted evangelistic meetings and prophecy seminars across Switzerland and in Germany. During his 50 years of service, Jakob Erzberger was instrumental in building up the fledgling Adventist presence in Europe. He is known to have produced and published the first indigenous German Adventist tracts. Although he had rarely held major organizational or leadership responsibilities, the sacrificial efforts of Erzberger played key roles in the grounding and establishing of Adventism in its earliest years in Europe. You can read more about Jakob Erzberger's life at encyclopedia.adventist.org. That was This Week in Adventist History. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Did you know that the Adventist Church has a YouTube channel where you can watch ANN video, ANN in depth, and plenty of other amazing videos on prophecy, health, and Bible study? Just go to the YouTube and search for the Adventist Church. Click the subscribe button to make sure you're caught up each week. And remember to leave a comment or a prayer request because we are we have people who are praying for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. The passage says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit Adventist.news for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care. <laughs>